Okay, I welcome everybody on our third lecture of astrochemistry course. This lecture will be given by uh, Professor Hans Olofsson from the Chalmers University of Technology from Gothenburg, Sweden. So, Hans, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, also for me, of course, a welcome everyone uh, to this lecture on the formation of the elements. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I have to say it will be probably be a, a bit of a physics heavy lecture, but, but I hope in the end that, that all of you would have a, a, a good overall understanding how the elements that surrounds us were once formed. Uh, fine. Perfect. Yeah, so let's start then. So I guess this is a, um, uh, a presentation of the elements that you're all familiar with. It's the periodic table starting with hydrogen in, in the upper left corner and then going to increasingly heavier elements as you go towards the right and downwards. Uh, of these, there are about 80 stable elements in nature, uh, meaning that there is at least one nucleus that is, is stable of, of, of these elements. And, and there is another about 20 uh, uh, which are radioactive but still found in nature. So in, in principle, about 100 of these occur naturally. And the question that comes up, of course, is can we explain their presence? Before we go into that, I'll just summarize here a little bit and uh, say that an atomic nucleus consists of protons and neutrons, and it's the number of, of protons that defines the element. Isotopes, that is the same element, but with different number of neutrons. And then, of course, the number of electrons eventually defines the chemical properties of, of the element. We will not deal with the chemical properties here. The question is, can we do even better than just explain how they are formed? And this is captured in this uh, figure here, where we see the abundances of the elements in the solar system. Starting with the lightest element uh, on the left, hydrogen, and going all the way up to uranium. And the abundance is given in a logarithmic scale where the value uh, for silicon has been chosen to be six, and then the other elements are in, relative to that. So the, uh, the question is, can we also explain this curve as we see here in front of us? I will comment a little bit on this, uh, uh, on this uh, curve. First, uh, one thing that one noticed directly is that the abundances decline sharply with atomic number. So the very heavy elements are much, much less abundant than hydrogen. Hydrogen constitutes about 70% by mass in the universe that we live, and helium constitutes about 28% by mass. All the other elements together constitute less than 2% by mass. And if you look at it by particle, then Common elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc., is less than a thousand by particle compared to hydrogen. There are a few other things to notice here. There is a marked dip in abundance around lithium, beryllium, and boron, and we'll come to that later on. There is also a marked peak around iron, and we'll also come to that later on. Then you also see that there is a kind of zigzag pattern in the abundance curve, meaning that nuclei with an even number of protons are more abundant than those with an odd number of protons. And, and that will also have to be explained. We think that this abundance distribution that you see here is very, very likely representative for the universe as a whole that we live in. At least on average, there may be, of course, local deviations. So the question is, what is the origin of the elements? And the first thing that came to mind to people was, of course, that they must have formed in the very young universe, shortly after the Big Bang. 
It turned out that that was not correct. In fact, only hydrogen and helium were able to form at reasonable abundances in the very early universe, and we will come back to that. In fact, essentially all elements that we see in the periodic table uh, were produced or have been produced in stars. Uh, there are a few other processes that also adds to it, and we will go through them later on. But essentially, the, this, uh, this lecture will be dominated by how stars form the elements. Just a quick summary on the origin of stars uh, before we enter into, um, into um, to the stars themselves. Uh, then we have to go back to something which is called the interstellar medium. And, and this is the medium between the stars. And it's composed of what we normally call clouds. Uh, and these clouds contain gas particles and microscopic dust grains. And... Um, the clouds have different characteristics in terms of density, temperature, ionization state, etc. And it is out of one of these type of clouds that stars are formed. They are formed in what is called the molecular clouds. And they're called molecular clouds because they are mainly composed of molecular hydrogen. There are clumps, density enhancements in these clouds. And these collapse, contract, from the original particle densities of about 10 to the 4 particles per cubic centimeter to the stellar densities of 10 to the 24 particles per cubic centimeters in about a million years. So this is uh, so this is an enormous compression of gas taking place to form stars out of the molecular clouds. So what happened is that the stars are, um, are part of a cosmic gas cycle, so to speak. They form out of gas, they evolve, and then they return the gas. And the gas, as we will see later on, is now enriched in heavier elements. And they do this during their most evolved stages. And you can see this exemplified here in, in, the, in the picture below here, where the stars, they form out of... Uh, of, of the molecular clouds, then they evolve. And it turns out that uh, low and intermediate mass stars, those with a mass less than about eight solar masses, they evolve slightly differently than the massive stars. But otherwise, the synthesis of the elements takes place in the stars. And when the stars die, they return this matter, which is then enriched, enriched in, in heavier elements. So let's start with stellar structure to understand how the stars form the elements. In principle, a star is a very simple thing. It's, a, it's an essentially spherical, non-rotating, non-magnetized body consisting of hydrogen and helium, and that's it. Of course, on such a on such a body, gravitation is acting, trying to contract it. But there is also a, a pressure from the inside, an internal pressure, which tries to resist this uh, gravitational inward uh, force. We also know that there is a loss of energy at the surface of the star, and this will have to be compensated by energy release inside the star. And it's actually this energy release that sets up the internal pressure needed to, uh, to counteract the gravitation. So during most of its lifetime, a star has a, a, a stable configuration and it, it maintains this through a detailed balance at each radius where gravitation is counterbalanced by the internal pressure. And when this is occurring, the star is said to be in hydrostatic equilibrium. In order to calculate the structure of a star, you need to solve the the, the structure equations. And I will not ask you to in any way to do that. I, I've just listed them here. So you get a feeling for the type of differential equations that you need to solve to understand the internal weight, uh, workings of a star. And, and these equations, as you see here, they apply in hydrostatic equilibrium. There is, there is no dependence on time. 
it turns out in the end that this is fairly complicated to do. It looks simple, but it's not so easy. And that's mainly due to the fact that there are various mechanisms that can set up the internal pressure. And there are also various mechanisms uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, transport the energy inside a star. There is evolution with time. And the main reason for evolution with time is the change of chemical composition inside the star. And this change is due to nuclear burning. I say burning here all the time. Of course, I do not mean uh, the type of burning that when, that's, that's present when you burn coal, for instance, by adding oxygen and so on. This is not a chemical process. This is a process which involves the atomic nuclei. And so we call it nuclear burning. And in stars, this proceeds on a very long time scale. It may happen that changes with time occur uh, on a more rapid time scale. And this is when nuclear burning processes cease to operate inside a star. And this happens usually at the end of stellar evolution. I, I will come back to that later on. And then some uh, nomenclature here. Uh, uh, sorry, I was just a bit led astray here by, uh, but yeah, okay, so it's working. Yeah, so X is the percentage of hydrogen by mass. Y is the percentage of helium by mass and Z is the percentage of all other elements by mass. Set is called the metallicity by astronomers. So all elements heavier than helium are metals to astronomers. And if you look at unevolved stars, that is stars that have not changed their, their chemical composition yet, uh, X is of the order 0.7 to 0.73 and, and Y is of the order 0.24 to 0.28, that is stars consists essentially only of, of hydrogen and helium. And Z can vary quite a lot. So the, the, the stars that were born in the early universe have, have very low metallicity, and there exist stars also that have a higher metallicity than the sun, and these are called supersolar metallicity stars. The, the solar values for hydrogen, uh, helium, and, and the heavy elements are given here uh, to the right. Okay, let's then have a look at stellar nuclear burning and, 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 and the fusion processes that are responsible for this. So the... I'm sorry, I have one thing that is sitting uh, on top of my slide here, so it makes it a bit difficult. But the, the, um, the nuclear burning in a star uh, and that drives stellar evolution is, is in the end leading to nuclear energy released and uh, it's being done through fusion. That is, lighter elements combine to form heavier elements, and the difference in binding energy is released. You can see here a figure which gives you the binding energy per nucleon as a function of, of um, the protons plus neutrons in the, in the nuclei. And there is a division line in the vicinity of iron and this means that if you combine elements lighter than iron, uh, this is fusion, you will get energy out of it. You can also get energy out of heavier elements, but then you have to destroy the element into lighter elements. And this is called fission. And this is what is used today, you know, in, in, um, in terrestrial power plants. Fission wouldn't work in stars because they are just too few heavy elements. It is fusion that works in stars. And it works all the way up to iron, but not longer than that. The principle of nuclear burning is, is relatively simple. 
it's the uh, release of binding energy through the fusion of two light nuclei. And I've illustrated that in, in, in the picture here, where you have a nucleus A uh, colliding with the nucleus B. They form what is called a compound nucleus C, which then decays into an element C and an element D. This is basically the process. It can be more com complicated, but this is basically the process. The amount of energy released is surprisingly simple to calculate. You just take the sum of the masses of the incoming particles, subtract the masses of the outgoing particles, and multiply by the speed of light squared, and then you get the energy that is released. That is, you, re you release what we call the binding energy. The problem with the process is that both A and B are positively charged. And that means that there will be a, a repulsive Coulomb force between the two particles. So this is not so easily done. And this is illustrated in, in the following picture where, uh, where you see what we call the interaction potential uh, as a function of the distance between the two particles A and B given here. And if the, um, if the potential is positive, it's repulsive. If it's negative, it's attractive. And what happens is that if you take these particles A and B and, and put them closer and closer, then the interaction energy goes up and it becomes more and more difficult to do this until you have pressed the particles so close to each other that they are at a distance of about 10 to the minus 15 meters from each other. If you manage to do that, then the attraction due to the strong nuclear force takes over and they are glued together. The height of the barrier that the particles will have to cross is given by this expression. So it's the uh, multiplication of the two charges and, uh, and it's given in, in energy unit, which is called mega electron volts. You don't really have to worry about that, but an electron volt is, is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So this is the amount of uh, energy that the particles need to uh, combine. Now, the only energy available in the stars to, to, um, to make this happen is kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is measured uh, through the temperature. And the corresponding kinetic temperature is then actually given by the charges, uh, the product of the charges, and times 10 to the 10 Kelvin. That is, you require 10 billion Kelvin to cross this barrier. And in principle, this would never work because the stars simply do not have these high temperatures in their central regions. It turns out that the whole thing worked due to a, a microscopic uh, process uh, due to um, the strange nature of quantum mechanics. It is the quantum mechanical tunneling process that makes this works work inside star because due to that, two particles can cross the barrier even if they do not have the required energy. Of course, it is a low probability event and it works in stars only for the fact that a star contains so many particles and this compensates for the highly inefficient process. This is something that will not work in, in, in a terrestrial laboratory. And that's why it is so difficult to us for us to, to build fusion reactors, because we need really much higher temperatures than we have in the star. Another thing that, that you can see from this is that the barrier is, uh, is proportional to the product of the charges of the nuclei. And this means that the different burning processes 
are actually well separated in time since the Coulomb barrier depends on this. And uh, so different nuclear burning processes required very different temperatures inside the star. And what happens in, inside a star is that the central temperature starts at a relatively modest level, and then it will increase over time as the star evolves. And so different processes will start. Okay, then it's time to look at the first uh, uh, nuclear burning uh, process inside a star. And this is, of course, hydrogen burning, because hydrogen is by far the most common uh, element in the stars, and the Coulomb potential to cross is the smallest uh, for all the elements. And so actually this occurs and starts efficiently in, in stars when the central temperature is, uh, is above about 4 million Kelvin. And it starts like this. It's called the proton-proton chain or the proton-proton-1 chain. And you take two hydrogen nuclei and you, you fuse them together and you produce uh, heavy hydrogen out of it. Uh, and, and, and this type of he heavy hydrogen is co called deuterium. It turns out that this is not an easy process. To combine two protons and form uh, uh, deuterium out of it, it's an extremely slow process. The time scale for this is 10 to the 10 years. That's comparable to the age of the universe. And this is one of the reasons why stars are so long-lived. But once again, the stars compensate by this by having so many particles, so many hydrogen particles that this actually occurs inside the stars. Once the deuterium is formed, it can, co can combine with another hydrogen nucleus and form a lighter form of helium, helium-3. This helium-3 nucleus can combine with another helium-3 nucleus formed in exactly the same way. And out of that, you get helium-4 and you get two uh, uh, hydrogen nuclei back. And so this is the way hydrogen fusion works. You take four hydrogen nuclei, you get helium-4 out of it. And this is by far the most efficient of all stellar fusion processes. Actually, 0.7% of the rest mass is converted into energy. And this corresponds to 80% of, of the possible energy that is available through fusion. So already in this first process, uh, the stars use up essentially all of the energy supply that they have. Of course, this released energy is then converted into kinetic energy and the particles uh, uh, of the particle, and this sets up the internal pressure that the stars need to be stable. Uh, there is one thing here, though, and this is this process up here, where you see something which is called new is emitted, and uh, and and the new stands for neutrinos. And I will not go into what the neutrinos really are, but these are sort of strange particles that do not interact strongly with other matter particles. And they escape the stars without interacting. So it leads to an energy loss. It has little meaning uh, in, in, in the context of hydrogen burning, but it will play an essential role later on. Now, nature is always more complicated than we would uh, want it to be. And there is not only one proton-proton chain, there are actually three proton-proton chain. So the proton-proton chain can happen in, in three different ways. And these proton-proton-2 and proton-proton-3 chains are coupled in as the temperature increases in the in, in the center of the stars. I will not really go into that. The main effect is the same thing. You take four hydrogen nuclei and out of it, you get a helium nucleus. 
The proton-proton chains dominate for stars with masses less than 1.3 solar masses. And this is a process that adds helium-4 to the universe. As we will see later on, most of the helium that we have in our universe was formed shortly after Big Bang, but the stars also add to it. Now to complicate things, hydrogen burning can uh, take place in, in a, another way. And this is called the CNO cycle. It requires a higher temperature than the proton-proton change and starts when the central, central temperature is about 15 million Kelvin. And it operates something like this. Carbon-12 is a catalyst here, so it requires that carbon nuclei are available in the stars. And you add a hydrogen a nucleus to it, and it goes through like this, and you add another hydrogen nucleus to it, and it continues like this, and you, you add another hydrogen nucleus to it, and then finally here you add another hydrogen nucleus to it, and then you get a nucleus that decays into helium-4, and you get the carbon-12 back again. So the end result is the same thing. You add four hydrogen nuclei, and out of it you get helium-4. Uh, it just goes in, in a slightly different way. And this is a, a fusion process that dominates for stars that are more massive than 1.3 solar masses. Now, of course, as usual, uh, nature is more complicated than, than we would have wanted to be. And also the CNO cycle can, uh, um, and, and, and there are more than, than one CNO cycle, so to speak. There are actually three CNO cycles because, because it can branch off here and go into two other types of, of cycles and so on. You don't really have to worry about that. The end result is the same thing. You add four hydrogen nuclei and you get helium-4 out of it. But it is an important process, actually, because this is the origin of carbon-12. And it's the origin of nitrogen-14 and of oxygen-17 in our universe. So this is really the first process where the stars start to uh, uh, to add new elements to our uh, our universe. And also here, these different cycles need a, a higher temperature to be operating than the uh, basic one, the CN cycle up here. Uh, this is just to, you don't really have to worry too much about this. This is just to show you the internal structure of a solar mass star with the age roughly similar to the sun, how it looks internally when it's burning hydrogen at the center. So it gives you the temperature, the density, uh, the luminosity, that is the amount of energy that has been released through nuclear burning processes and the abundance of, of hydrogen uh, here. It's a little bit tricky because it's not given as a function of radius inside the star, it's given as a function of the enclosed mass inside a given radius. So you'll have to be a little bit careful when you read this figure. But the thing to take home from this is that nuclear synthesis takes place only in the central part of the star, only within about 20% of the radius and less than 30% of the mass of the star is involved in, in nucleosynthesis. Uh, so that's the take home message really of, of this figure here. Uh, you can also have a look at what is encircled here because this gives you the, the central values of uh, for instance, the density and the temperature. So you see that the temperature of, of, of a solar-like star at the age of the sun is about 16 million Kelvin. That's the central temperature of the sun. 
Now, this will continue and the hydrogen that you have in here will burn into helium and it will continue until there is no hydrogen left any longer. And this is illustrated here. This is a structure of a solar mass star when it is more than 10 giga years old. Because in that case, there is no hydrogen left here in the center. There is a core that consists essentially only of helium. And outside that is the envelope. And that envelope is essentially unaffected but about what's happened inside here. Then there is a shell where hydrogen burning still continues. But what happens here is that this essentially divides the star into two parts, a core and an envelope. And these will develop differently as time goes on now. All right. So what happens then uh, and, uh, during the subsequent evolution of the star? Well, what happens is when central nuclear burning ceases, and in this case, when central hydrogen burning ceases, the pressure in the core is not enough to uh, uh, counteract the gravitation and the core will start to contract. The effect of that is that the envelope will start to expand. And so you will get a star where the core is contracting and the envelope is expanding. When the core contracts, it will heat up because of release of gravitational energy. And eventually it had heated up enough for a new uh, nuclear burning process to start. And, and this is something that may occur several times during the evolution of a star, and it will follow each uh, nuclear burning stage and will allow uh, uh, the emergence of a new nuclear burning stage. So we will have a look then at the first uh, uh, nuclear burning stage that follows uh, hydrogen burning. And that for natural reasons will be helium burning because now there is a lot of helium in the nucleus and the, uh, the charges of the helium nuclei is not that high. So this, this is likely the next uh, process to start. But it requires a higher temperature than hydrogen burning because you take now two nuclei which have a, a positive charge of two and try to put them together. And so you need a temperature at the center of the star, which isn't higher than 100 million Kelvin. Remember the central temperature of the sun today is 15 million Kelvin. So, so this would not work in, in the center of the sun. But in the contracting core, it will eventually reach this temperature and you get to helium burning. This is a bit of a strange process it starts with two helium nuclei that combines and they form eight beryllium. And then eight beryllium combines with another helium nucleus and you form carbon 12, to carbon 12. And this is the end process of helium burning. So it's actually a three particle uh, process. You add three helium nuclei and get carbon 12 out of it. You can also add helium-4 to any existing carbon-12 when you form uh, oxygen-16 out of it. And, or you can, you can add a uh, helium-4 uh, nucleus to an oxygen carbon nucleus and, and form neon-20 out of it. And this is the process which is the origin of the carbon that we have in our universe, the carbon-12 that we have in our universe, and the oxygen-16 that we have in our universe, and also the neon-20. So there's an extremely important process. I mean, we are all made of carbon, oxygen, uh, etc. The thing is that this is an extremely unlikely process. And the reason is that 8 beryllium the intermediate stage here is a highly unstable nucleus. 
the lifetime is only 10 to the minus 16 seconds. And so normally, and you know, this would this would simply not work. The only reason that it works is because the carbon-12 nucleus happens to have what we call an internal state inside the nucleus that makes th this process that you have here a, a, a so-called resonant process. That is, it's much more efficient than it would be otherwise. So the fact that this process is much more efficient than it would be otherwise, combined with the fact that there are so many helium nuclei uh, in, uh, in, in, in the centers of the star, makes this process actually work. And it leads to an efficient production of carbon, oxygen, and neon. But the overall efficiency is only 10% of that of hydrogen burning. So uh, that's not that much energy released any longer for the star to live on. Okay, so what happens now is we have a core of carbon and when helium burning is over, that core starts to contract, the envelope expand, and eventually the temperature of the core is high enough. It will come in the range of close to a, a billion Kelvin now for the next nuclear burning process to start. And that will be carbon burning because now the core has a lot of carbon. And now things really become messy and I will not go through any details whatsoever here, but the whole thing starts with two uh, carbon-12 nuclei combining to form a compound nucleus of, of magnesium-24, which then decays into this. And, and then it becomes really, really messy. But the main products in the end of this uh, of, of carbon burning is the production of oxygen 16, neon 20, sodium 23, magnesium 24, and sulfur 32. There is one important thing here, and that is that in this process here, the neutrinos that we've ignored for before, because we knew that they were removing energy from the star, but uh, it, it was sort of neglected. We didn't have to worry about it. Now the neutrino losses are substantial. And actually, most of the energy that's released here is, is removed from the star in the form of neutrino losses. And this makes life very difficult for the, st for the star. Okay, after carbon burning, you will have a core, which is mainly composed of of oxygen 16, that core will contract and heat up and eventually reach a temperature where the next nuclear burning process can start. And I guess you would all have expected it to be oxygen burning, but it isn't. And the reason is that oxygen nucleus has an even number of both protons and neutrons, and this makes it extra stable meaning that it's it's more difficult to burn oxygen than we would have expected, maybe. And actually, the next stage is instead neon burning or neon melting. And this occurs at a temperature of about one and a half billion Kelvin inside the star. And it starts not with putting neon nuclei together, it actually starts with photodisintegration, where a lot of the neon nuclei are destroyed and, uh, by, by energetic photons. And instead, oxygen-16 and helium-4, the alpha particle, is released. And then these released helium nuclei uh, are, are formed, uh, are confused together with, uh, with oxygen-16 and neon-20. And, and form neon 20 and magnesium 24. And so the main final products of this <laughs> nuclear burning stage is 16 oxygen and magnesium 24. And now we, we are sort of slowly getting towards the end here. Eventually we will get oxygen burning, but you need a temperature about 
above 2 billion Kelvin now. And also here, of course, everything is messy. It starts with the combination of two uh, oxygen nuclei and you form a compound of 32 sulfur that decays and, and then it becomes very messy. But essentially the main final products are silicon 28 and sulfur 32. And this leads us to the final uh, nuclear burning process that can occur in stars. And this is silicon burning. And now you need a temperature of almost 4 billion Kelvin in, in, in the core of the star. And like neon uh, burning, it starts with photo disintegration where success, we start with silicon 28 that, that is destroyed. You form magnesium 24 that is destroyed, etc., etc., And you release a lot of helium-4 nuclei, which can then combine with silicon 28 until you finally uh, produced nickel-56, which decays into iron-56. And this is the origin of iron-56 in our universe. And it's also the end of stellar fusion, because you cannot take two hydrogen nuclei and fuse them together and get, and get energy out of it. That doesn't really work, because you're on the wrong side now and, um, uh, of, of this curve where you had fusion on one side and fission on the other side. So this is the end of it. Uh, and this is just a summary of, uh, of what we've been going through in, in, in a sense. Uh, so uh, we have the, uh, the nuclear burning processes here. And I show this as an example for a star which is uh, 20 times more massive than the sun. And uh, over here we have the duration of, of these different nuclear burning stages. And then one has to realize first that the lifetime of a star is determined by its initial mass. And it's strongly dependent on its initial mass and it follows this formula over here. And, and you can see from that formula that the lifetime of a star which is more much more massive than the sun is much shorter than that of the sun. That would sound strange because it would have much more hydrogen but the reason is that it consumes the hydrogen at a much higher rate than the lower mass star will do. So a 20 solar mass star will only live for about 10, bill, 10 million years, as you can see over here, when it burns hydrogen uh, to helium. The sun, on the other hand, will live for 10 billion years by fusing hydrogen to helium. And then if you, if, if you see at the rest here, you see the helium burning uh, time scale for a 20 solar mass star is, is only a million years. Carbon burning is only 300 years. And then when you get to neon, oxygen and silicon, we're talking about days and, and so. And the reason for that is of course, there is very little energy released and whatever energy is released, is, is, uh, is gone uh, in the form of neutrinos. Okay, so uh, we're getting towards the end now of, of nuclear burning inside stars. Uh, and this is just an, an, uh, uh, a diagram uh, that I introduce here because it's very often used in the study of, of stars. It has the luminosity of a star on, on the y-axis, and it has the surface temperature of the star on, on the x-axis. And when you plot real stars into a diagram like this, it does not produce a scatter diagram of any kind. Actually, it turns out that all stars lie on a, on a sequence or a line almost like this in this diagram. And this is called the main sequence. And this is where the stars lie when they are burning hydrogen in their centers. And you can see here, so this is the lifetime of different stars as a function of their mass. 
The massive stars are much more luminous. They live up here and, and they live for much shorter times. The less massive stars are much less luminous than the sun and they live for a very long time. This diagram is called the hatchbrung russell diagram and is a very important tool in the, in the study of stars. So uh, to wrap this part of the whole thing up, uh, you will also have to realize that all stars do not go through all nuclear burning processes. And the reason for that is that I've said all the time that core contraction is the key for new nuclear burning to start. You need the core to contract, to heat up, to allow a new nuclear burning process to, to start. And, and as we have indicated, core contraction can occur several times during the evolution of a star and, and you get new nuclear burning uh, processes to start. But it may happen that a pressure is set up inside the star that does not allow the core to contract. And actually, this is what happens inside star. Another type of pressure is eventually set up that prevents core contraction. And it is a microscopic process that I will explain shortly that, that's responsible for this. And it is mass dependent. So the mass will determine whether a star will go through all these processes or not. Now, so what is the process? Yeah, it's a bit of a tricky thing that I will not describe in any detail, but it is a microscopic process that depends on the effects of quantum mechanics. The pressure is set up by something which is called the degeneracy pressure of electrons. And the reason for this is that electrons are fermions and they cannot be infinitely packed into what is called phase space the space made out of, of, of space and momentum. And this is actually the, uh, the reason for the Pauli exclusion principle, which I guess most of you have heard about. And it also plays a role inside stars in, in, in a very completely different context. But it means that if you cannot pack them infinitely, uh, dense, uh, it means that at the high densities that you eventually get in the course of the star, the kinetic energy of the electron goes up into very, very much higher energies than the thermal energy of the electrons and hence their pressure will becomes much higher than the thermal energy or the thermal pressure. And this will, in some cases, stop the core from contracting. And if the core co cannot contract any, anymore, the temperature will not go up and there will be no more nuclear burning. And this is all summarized in this <laughs> somewhat tricky uh, figure here that I will not expect you to read in any detail, but it captures the temperature in the center of the star and the density in the center of the star as it evolves from its birth to its death up here. The thing to take away with you is the following. If you have an object that is that has a mass less than a tenth of a solar mass, it will never ignite hydrogen. It will stay as what is called a brown dwarf, meaning that the way we define stars, it will never become a star. If the star is a, have a mass above 0.1 solar mass, but below 0.5 solar masses, it will start hydrogen burning, but it will never ignite helium. If it has a mass below 0 0.5, above 0 0.5 solar masses, but below about eight solar masses, it will start helium burning, but will never go through carbon burning. This is what our sun will do. 
if the mass is higher than eight solar masses, it will go through all the nuclear burning phases, carbon burning, neon burning, oxygen burning, and silicon burning. And so it is the initial mass of the star which determines which nuclear burning processes it will go through. So, uh, in, in summary here now, the low to intermediate stars do not go further than helium burning, and, and this will leave a core that consists mainly of, of carbon and oxygen. And in the case of the lowest mass stars that do not start helium burning, it will consist of helium. While the massive stars will go all the way, and this, and this will actually in the end seriously affect the core, which will I will come to, to later and describe. And and uh, in in the in in the case of the low to intermediate mass stars, this core that remains will be stable, consisting of carbon and oxygen. In the case of the massive star, the core which is consists essentially only of silicon, will not be stable because the pressure that's set up in it, it will not be enough to prevent the core from contracting. Actually, the core will collapse. And we'll come to that a little bit later. And the collapse will lead to the formation of the neutron star or a black hole. And this will only take a few seconds. So the end results of fusion. Here you have a summary of the elements or, the, uh, or their isotopes that are the process of stellar uh, fusion process or stellar nuclear burning. And you see the processes on the right hand side responsible for this. And if we then go back again to the uh, periodic table, I've encircled here now all the elements that are produced through nuclear burning. But you see, <laughs> there are a lot of elements left that are not produced during nuclear, uh, nuclear burning processes. And so uh, we spent almost an hour now going through all the basics behind producing these few elements in the periodic table now. But what about the rest? I mean, how are they produced? Well, I will explain that. But I, I think, I suggest we, we take a, a sort of like a five minute break and, and try to digest all of this. And, uh, and I'll be back again, uh, say five, five minutes after four and, uh, and we see what, how all the other elements are, are produced, okay? So I, I just stop my video and, and then I'll be back in, in about five minutes. So, okay, I'm, uh, I'm back again. I, uh, I hope I haven't killed all of you <laughs> by this uh, somewhat lengthy discussion on how um, stars go through nuclear burning. Uh, but as I ended uh, just before this short break, is that uh, the, the nuclear burning processes inside stars actually uh, produces a minority of all the elements in the periodic table. And what about the rest? Well, we'll have still have to turn to the stars. They are also produced in the stars, essentially all of them, but in a, in a different way. Essentially all of them, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand what's, why I have this problem, but I... I have to start my... Uh, my screen sharing again. Okay. Mm 
Yeah, okay. The way they do it is called neutron capture processes. And, and it's, it goes like this, it's not very complicated. Uh, you, you have a, a nucleus of some kind and it captures a neutron. And this capture is then followed by what is called a, a beta decay, uh, that is a radioactive uh, decay, where the neutron decays into a proton and an electron. And of course, if the neutron decays into a, a proton, you have a new element, right? Because you've added a proton to the nucleus. So it's really not more complicated than that. Uh, it occurs mainly in two ways. One is called the S process. And in this case, the nucleus decays before another neutron is captured after the first one. And the other process is called the R process. And in this case, the nucleus decays only after capturing several neutrons. And I just have an example down here to, to show you how it works. And, and it's a, a simple R process started starting with a, an, an isotope of tungsten, 183 tungsten, which captures a neutron. And, and it forms 184 tungsten, which then captures another neutron and forms 185 tungsten, which is sufficiently radioactive to decay into a new, new nucleus, which is called rhenium-185. And so you go from tungsten to rhenium and produced a new element. And this is the way most of the objects in the periodic, most of the elements in the periodic table have been produced. There's one thing to note here, uh, and that is that the neutron is a, is a neutron particle, of course, so there is no Coulomb barrier here. So uh, it's, it's not temperature sensitive in any way and can proceed at, actually at lower temperatures. The S process, and here S stands for slow, it operates during mainly during helium burning, but also to some extent during carbon, oxygen, and silicon burning. And it synthesizes a large number of the elements in the periodic tables up to bismuth 209. This is the heaviest still stable element. The R process, and here R stands for rapid then, it operates mainly during explosive events like supernovae, uh, which I will come to, and binary mergers that I will also come to. And it synthesizes also a large number of the elements in the periodic tables. And in this case, all the way up to uranium-238. Uh, and this is to illustrate uh, the results of, of stellar neutral, uh, neutron capture processes. So, uh, so you have here, you have a number of, of um, elements uh, heavier than, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't remember the astat or something, estate or something like that. I can't remember exactly the name of this one, but it's here. This, this element up here is, is also here. And here you see the abundance uh, uh, distribution that we have in the solar system. And, and th this is the abundances here that's, uh, that's been observed in the solar system. And this is a model where you calculate the amount of, of different elements produced in the population of stars that go through neutron capture processes. And it turns out that uh, there is a very good resemblance between what you see here, of what is observed, and what you calculate. And to a large extent, we can explain all of these elements uh, and their relative abundances by neutron capture processes. And, and that's quite remarkable because the S and R processes that I mentioned before, that they give such a smooth curve as we see here, considering that they operate under very, very different physical conditions. But, but this is the case. 
there is also another uh, process and it's called the I process and and not uh, unexpectedly this is the intermediate neutron capture process meaning that the neutron flux that the nuclei are, are exposed to is intermediate between those of the S and the R process. So the S process, you have a low neutron flux and the R process, you have a high neutron flux. And it's not entirely clear how this works, but it is thought to be due to an ingestion of protons into the helium burning region and actually in, into something which is called a convective helium burning region. Uh, and I will not go through exactly how this, this works. And it actually remains to be determined the astrophysical importance of this process. But it may very well be that some of the elements uh, uh, that we see around us are actually produced in the eye process. And then finally, there is a last process that's operating inside star and is called proton capture. And the reason for this is that there are some elements that cannot form via the neutron capture on any time scale. And, and these uh, are objects that, uh, that are proton rich and, and have no radioactive parents. So, so there is no way they, they can uh, form via neutron capture. And they are formed via the what, what we call the P process, where a proton is captured in, instead um, of a neutron. Now, so, such isotopes are fairly rare. And uh, the reason is, of course, that now there is a Coulomb barrier here. The proton is, is uh, positively charged and the nuclei are positively charged. Charge, so, so there is a Coulomb barrier to penetrate as opposed to the case in, of neutron capture. And, uh, and so this makes these elements fairly rare. The formation site is probably the same as where the R process is active. Uh, that is in supernovae and, and some binary systems. Sometimes you also call this uh, this process the rapid proton capture process or the RP process. But there are few, very few elements that are produced in this way. And so in conclusion, uh, it, is it is during their final evolutionary stages when they go through all these uh, different nuclear burning processes and uh, and when they also release a lot of neutrons so that the neutron capture processes can work, that the star synthesizes most of the elements uh, in uh, uh, that we see in the periodic table. And during these, this stage, the stars are all located up in this upper uh, left corner of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. This is where you find the red giants and the super giants and so on. And these are the objects which, which are responsible for, for all the, the formation of the elements. Of course, it is not enough for the stars to produce all these elements in their interiors. If it is to be of any interest to us, they must also return this matter to, to, to the universe, so to speak, so that over time, the abundances of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or whatever can build up to the extent that uh, even life can uh, emerge. And, and so the question is, how do the stars return this nuclear enriched matter? Well, it's done in two ways, but all of it happens, fortunately, uh, at the same time as the stars also go through the nuclear burning or, or element formation processes, namely while they're up in this part of the Hertzsprung russell diagram. And it's done in two ways, either through a stellar wind or through an explosion. And we start with the stellar wind. And this is the way low to intermediate mass stars up to about eight solar masses return 
matter to uh, the surroundings. And the nuclear process material leaves the star when the stars when they become red giants for the second time. And, and in this stage uh, of their evolution, they are called asymptotic giant branch stars. And, and the material leaves the stars through an intense stellar wind that is blowing from the surface of the star. And this is a very intense wind and the stars can lose several solar masses of material until only the core remains. And you see two examples here. The stellar wind will eventually be heated and also ionized by the radiation from the hot stellar remnant, the, the core. The surface of the core will have a temperature of the order 100,000 Kelvin or something like that. And it will illuminate and heat and ionize the gas that is uh, uh, that is expelled away from the star and is leaving the star and is moving into the cosmic medium again. Oh, sorry. Uh, and you see two examples here. This is one example, the Helix Nebula. You see the material around here that's been expelled by the star. It's nuclear enriched material and the core or as the astronomers call them, the white dwarfs. The white dwarf is, is seen in here. This is another uh, of these type of objects. This is the material that's been expelled from the star and the white dwarf remains in here. These type of objects are called planetary nebulae. And this is the way low to intermediate mass stars return matter that's been enriched by, uh, by elements. For the massive stars, the ejection is an explosive event. And the reason for that I've touched upon already before. The reason is that the what remains after silicon burning, the core that remains after silicon burning is not stable. The core will start to contract and it will actually collapse. And it will do this on a very short time scale. It's a matter of seconds only. Imagine yourself, this is a huge core of a massive star that collapses in, in, in a few seconds. And it releases a huge amount of energy, gravitational energy. It releases uh, as much as 10,000 billion solar luminosities over about a month. So it's an enormous amount of energy that is being released. However, essentially all of this is released in the form of these elusive neutrinos and uh, which just escape out uh, from, uh, uh, from the collapsing object. But there are some of it remains and this, uh, the, the energy that remains goes into expanding the envelope of the star that surrounds the core that has collapsed. And this, uh, in, uh, this, uh, in this stellar envelope, there is still a lot of nuclear, nuclear synthesis going on. And, and the released energy uh, leads to an expansion of all this material, almost in the same way as the stellar wind for the lower mass stars. Actually, only a tiny fraction, about 0.1% of all the energy is in the end emitted in the form of light. And this is light that we can see a few hours after the collapse. And this we call a supernova. And you see one here, one of the uh, latest supernovae that was clearly visible to the naked eye. It expl exploded in, in, uh, in February 1987 in, uh, in a, uh, an irregular, irregular galaxy that you cannot see from the Northern Hemisphere hemisphere, but you can see it from the southern hemisphere, namely the large Magellanic cloud. And, and it looked like this. And in this way, the massive stars return the nuclear enriched uh, material. Now, once again, life is a little bit more complicated than, uh, than we 
uh, would have liked. And there are, uh, in fact, um, a number of different supernovae. Basically, we can divide them into two classification. And the first one is core collapse of massive star. And this is what I've just explained. It's the core, core collapse of massive stars. And it leads to supernovae of type two. There's another way uh, that supernovae can occur. And this is through the thermonuclear explosion of a white dwarf that has been accreted matter from a companion, which eventually leads to explosive, explosive nuclear burning or a th thermonuclear explosion that, that, that blow the the white dwarf into pieces and release a lot of nuclear enriched uh, material. And these type of supernovae are, are called type 1a. And uh, I have two examples here of, of supernovae and, and actually the, the, the supernovae remnants. Uh, as you see here, this is one example of a supernova remnant. This is another example of a supernova remnant. And it's filled with nuclear process material. And it will appear in the sky like this for thousands of years after the explosion, the supernova explosion. And the one to the left here is the Crab Nebula. And it's a type two, that is a core collapse supernova that exploded uh, 1054 uh, in uh, AD. Of course, it didn't explode then. <laughs> you have to realize that it took took a while for the light from this supernova to reach us here on Earth, but we saw it in 1054 uh, AD. And this is Kepler's nova, and this is uh, another type of supernova. This is an accreting white dwarf supernova, type 1a. But once again, lots of material here, uh, 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 nuclear rich material. And this exploded in 1604 uh, AD. In this case, there is a stellar remnant left. There is a, a, a neutron star in here uh, that lies in the center here. In this case, there is no nothing left. It, it all just explodes into pieces. Okay, um, once again, things are a little bit messier than you would have hoped. So, so when the study of, of stellar yields and, and how, I mean, the, the amount of, of matter, nuclear enriched matter, produced and, and returned by the stars, and how this leads to what we call galactic chemical evolution, have traditionally assumed, partly for simplicity, that stars are isolated objects and, the and they follow the evolution that I described to you here. However, that turns out not to be the case, really. Observations show that most stars actually belong to multiple systems. That is systems of gravitationally bound stars, two or more. Uh, and in fact, in many cases, uh, the stars are so close to each other that they interact with each other. And of course, then they will follow an evolution which is different from what I have described here. And it means also that their nucleosynthetic properties will be a little bit different. And, and this, uh, this uh, uh, the fact that they belong to multiple systems appears to be higher, the higher the masses, so that the more massive the stars are, the more they are affected by this. Now, this makes things a lot more complicated uh, because binary star evolution can proceed in many different ways. And so, so uh, it, it becomes much more difficult to follow binary star nucleosynthesis. And uh, 
also here by tradition it's uh, focused on explosive events like supernova type 1a that i uh, discussed before this is of course an effect of binary uh, interaction where matter is transferred from a companion to the white dwarf and also classical novae which are also a, a type of objects where where mass is transferred from one star to the other and you get uh, uh, a kind of, of uh, nuclear burning and uh, and new elements are formed. In both cases, this uh, uh, is driven by gas secretion from a companion. However, something has emerged over the last years, and, uh, and this is more, uh, uh, sort of, more spectacular uh, uh, interactions between binary objects, and uh, that actually needs to the leads to the uh, full fusion of the stellar objects and uh, and 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 the resulting uh, nucleosynthesis after that, and uh, in particular uh, the mergers of two neutron stars. That is the remnants. Uh, that are left behind after a supernova explosion. Such neutron stars, which essentially consist only of neutrons, can merge if they are close enough to each other and, and move uh, close to each other and then finally merge. And we know that such mergers exist because we've seen gravitational waves from them. And it is believed that such mergers can produce a lot of the elements that we see in our universe through the R process. The question is how much, and it's very hard to, to quantify this. And so for the moment, I, I will really leave this, leave this uh, because it would lead too far to go into it. But one should always have in mind <laughs> that, uh, uh, that Binary star, star evolution and mergers could play an essential role here. So uh, going back again, which, con which star contributes to what that we see here? Well, this is a bit of a tricky question as well. You need to know the contribution of a single star and we go through that, but you also need to know the in detail the progress of, of nuclear synthesis and the details of how the star uh, <clears throat> returned this matter uh, to, uh, to its surroundings. And you need to know the number of stars in, in the phase when they contribute most. And this means that you also need to know the initial distribution in mass of stars. That is, how many stars do you have in a given mass range? And how much time do they spend in the phase when they contribute the most? And then, as I, I, as I said before, many of the elements may be contribute to the binary system, and then things really become a bit um, more, more messy. But if, if we summarize this, we think it's roughly something like this. It is actually still a bit unclear whether carbon and nitrogen are contributed by ADB stars. You know, the red giants uh, 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 that emerge from, from low and intermediate ma mass stars, or whether it's massive stars or core collapse supernovae. Oxygen is fairly clear that that's uh, produced in core collapse supernovae. Neon and all the alpha elements, I mean, the, ele the, the elements you get by adding uh, helium nuclei to neon and upwards, uh, up to iron, they are produced in massive stars and, and core collapse supernovae. Iron is presently, I would say, produced in supernovae of type 1a. But that is only presently. If you go back in time, they were uh, the iron was produced in massive stars. And then the elements beyond iron are produced by AGB stars, supernovae, and binary systems, and, and the different 
layers here contributes to different uh, different elements and <clears throat> sorry yeah so this is roughly how we think that the different elements uh, have been uh, produced and i'll uh, come back to a summary here but there is additional nucleosynthesis in our universe and we've touched upon one of them already namely big bang nucleosynthesis and there is another process called spallation and i would just very quickly go through that as well so if you take big bang nucleosynthesis the idea was first that all elements are are, are produced in in the big bang but that turned out not to work for reasons that I will explain now. The nucleosynthesis in the Big Bang uh, um, occurs under very different conditions than the conditions that we have in stars that go through uh, stellar fusion. Here, the nucleosynthesis takes place in an expanding low density gas where you have free neutrons. And so this is a very different uh, uh, way than, than uh, a very different conditions under which uh, the elements are formed than in, uh, in the stars. So if we look at the universe and we have the Big Bang somewhere over here to the right, and then you have the fraction of, of different species on the Y axis. And when you start up, you have only hydrogen and neutron. And, and then time goes on. And when the universe is about three minutes after the Big Bang, then suddenly you get uh, nuclear uh, processing processes going. And after uh, a few hundred seconds or something like that, you're left with uh, uh, a universe consisting of, of hydrogen, of helium-4, and then trace amounts of a num of number of other species. And the question is, why doesn't it go further than this? Well, the, the reason is it effectively stops at helium-4 because there are no stable nuclei with five and eight nucleons. If you remember the triple alpha process, the, the helium burning process, it it went beyond this uh, fact that there is no stable uh, eight uh, nucleon with eight, with a mass of eight, because there are so many uh, helium nuclei around that it managed to do that. But in the early universe, this simply doesn't work. So the triple alpha process cannot work and you cannot produce carbon 12 and then go on from that in the early universe. That's why it stops here. But the important thing is that it produces all the deuterium that we have in our universe. It produces all the helium-3 that we have in our universe and essentially all the helium-4 that we have as well. And some trace amounts of lithium-7 and, and, uh, and uh, beryllium-7. Actually, these two elements are produced by the next process and that's spallation. Spallation occurs when a nucleus of some kind is bombarded by a by a high energy particle, and uh, and this um, the incident particle could be a proton or 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 something or, or something heavier than that will then disintegrate the nucleus, and the result of that is that you you will get protons, neutrons, helium four, and so on and other particles. In the cosmic case, the main effect is actually the, the production of lithium, boron, and beryllium. And they are formed through the spallation of oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, maybe silicon, in the interstellar medium. Uh, so high energy particles, we call them cosmic ray particles, they hit the oxygen, uh, nitrogen, carbon nuclei and, and form lithium, beryllium and boron. And this is called spallation. And this is the final uh, process by which elements are formed in, in our universe. So if we summarize all this, we're back now to the uh, periodic table here. 
you have all the elements here and for each <clears throat> for each element you see the contribution from the six six different uh, uh, processes that I've been uh, explaining for you the big bang the mergers, this uncertain process where you have mergers of neutron stars and so on, the AGB stars, the supernovae of different type and spallation. And you can see how much of each element is contributed uh, by this by this six different processes. I can say this is not the final word. Uh, there is still work going on. Uh, and and things may change here as time goes on, but it's 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 relatively close to the final word. Of course, this is something that has been uh, has been uh, yeah changing over time, and and this is what we call the chemical evolution of the universe, and it is an effect of nuclear synthesis in generations of stars where stars have have. Bor been born, evolved and died, new stars have been born, evolved and died. And in this cosmic gas cycle where the stars uh, uh, participate, new elements are synthesized all the time. And if you go back to the very early universe, of course, there were very few metals. This is a diagram giving metallicity normalized to the metallicity of the sun as a function of age starting with the bang, Big Bang and up to today, when the universe is um, 13, roughly 13.8 giga year old. And it started off with very low metallicities. And then there was a rapid increase due to the early generation of, of very massive stars, we think. And then there has been a gradual increase due to later generations of what we would call no, more normal stars like the sun. The sun entered here about four and a half giga years ago, so it's a latecomer on the stage, stage and, and its uh, metallicity is then representative of the metallicity of the universe at this time of, uh, of evolution of the universe. And the metallicity has increased somewhat since the star was uh, the sun was born. And this is once again summarized in essentially the same uh, uh, figure that I showed you before. You have the periodic table. You see how the different processes have contributed uh, to the different elements. But here you also see it as a function of time. So you see how the different elements reach their uh, abundances today as a function of time through these different processes. And once again, this is not the final word because there are many uh, uncertainties here. And if you compare this uh, diagram with the previous figure I had here, you can see that there, there are differences and there are especially differences <clears throat> that relates to the importance of mergers. The question of, of how how to what extent mergers of stars, mergers of neutron stars contribute to this or not. And I say then finally uh, that we have to a large extent explained the solar system abundances. We know the origin to some extent at least uh, of the different elements and we can explain their relative abundances. But there are details and I would say details that remains here to, to be explained. Uh, and much of it has to do with, uh, with uh, the problem of, of, of uh, multiple star systems, binary star evolution, the mergers and so on. That's, I would say it's there where you have the main uncertainties. Also the way the stars return matter, there are some, in some cases, considerable uncertainties there that, that also remain to, to be explained. But overall, I would say we have a, reasonably good view on how all of this came into existence. And by that, I, I thank you. I, I hope I 
as I said before, I hope I haven't killed you by all of by all of this. It's been a, it's it's been maybe a, a, a heavy <laughs> tour uh, through the formation of the elements. But thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice and uh, very clear lecture about the origin of elements. And now this lecture is open for the question. So I encourage everyone to ask question in the chat. Those who place uh, their questions very early in the lecture, they may think to resubmit their questions. So they are not buried really at the end. So, Okay, I can see that we have already now a lot of questions. So mm -hmm. Hans, you can probably open chat and uh, simply have a look uh, through the questions. Moreover, if somebody wants to ask question by voice, he can just raise their hand and we would allow to unmute. Okay. Okay, so how do we play it? <laughs> I can see that's quite a lot of questions. So, <laughs> yes, you just uh, read the question, uh, maybe in the order like they appear, but uh, it's yeah. <laughs> yes, I will try to capture them before they before they disappear. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I, there's there's a so I I I start at the end here. Uh, uh, the one there's one question when uh, uh, when the P process will happen and when the M capture uh, process will happen. And I think I answer that actually. Uh, uh, you you will have. I mean, you will all get the possibility to download the lecture notes, so uh, you can have a look there. And it's uh, the answer is in there. Also, at the end of the, of the lecture notes, I, I have a, a list of interesting books to read if you really want to go into the details of what's going on here. Uh, okay, let me take a, a question here. And the question is, which are the main techniques of determining universe abundances of elements? Uh, well, there are different ways of doing it. The... Uh, Abundance curve for the solar system is determined essentially in two ways. It's first looking at the sun and uh, determining the abundances in the sun, and then also looking at meteorites and determining the abundances in the meteorites, and then and then somehow join this together to get the abundances uh, in the solar system. And then one normally assumes that this is actually representative of the universe as it is today. Otherwise, determine elemental abundances of, for instance, stars is done through stellar spectroscopy. You take spectra of the stars, those spectra will contain spectral lines from different elements, and through a model of the atmospheres of the stars, you can then calculate back what the abundance of different elements are. These are basically the, the primary methods of determining uh, abundances in, in, in our universe. And then there's a question uh, about radioactive elements and uh, and and why they are radioactive well it's simply because the nucleus is not stable any longer it's uh, in the nucleus there is a balance between the attractive strong nuclear force between the protons and the neutrons but there is also repulsion in the nucleus because all the protons uh, are, are trying to repulse each other. And as long as the uh, as the strong nuclear force, the attractive nuclear force is stronger than the repulsive force uh, of, of the Coulomb uh, 
the Coulomb repulsive force, the the uh, the, nu the the nucleus will essentially r remain stable, but if uh, if there are too many protons in uh, in, in in the nucleus, it it will actually uh, decay, and uh, and this is the one of the primary reasons be, behind radio uh, radioactive decay. And then, of course, the neutrons are also inherently unstable and will um, decay through beta decay. Okay, I'll see if I have undergo. And there's a question here, which factors will dis decide which type of supernovae will happen? Yeah, that is a tricky question. Uh, as I said before, we have this essentially two different types of <clears throat> supernova. The type two ones that depends on core collapse. And, and these occurs in and these occur in massive stars. The way they look will depend on, to a large extent, the amount of circumstellar material surrounding the stars when they explode. This will lead to a, a plethora of different type of, of uh, type two supernovae. The other type of supernovae, uh, the type one A supernovae, they are of a completely different uh, uh, breed. They occur when a white dwarf, which is initially stable, will get material dumped on it from a companion. And if the mass of that white dwarf will exceed something which is called the Chandra Seca mass, which is about 1.4 solar masses, then it is not stable any longer. The internal pressure is not able to resist the gravitational pressure and it will collapse and it will lead, it will lead to an enormous heating up of the material and you will get a thermonuclear explosion. So these are basically the two ways of, of getting uh, uh, supernovae. But then it also depends, as I said, on the environment of the supernova. Uh, okay, let's see if I found... Ah, <laughs> uh, the, one other question is, this is the formation of nuclei. How about the atoms? Uh, well... Uh, I have only talked about nuclei, and the reason for that is, that, of course, that inside the stars, the temperatures are so high that that all atoms are ionized. And uh, so you have the nuclei that move around there, and, and you have all the electrons there as well that also move around. But for the nuclear burning processes, the electrons play essentially no role. It's only at the surfaces of the stars where uh, gradually, you know, when the temperatures are low enough, the electrons combine with the, with the nuclei and you get atoms. And so this is the first place where you get the atoms. And, when, and then, you know, when, when, when this uh, material is, is expelled out to, the, um, out to the cosmic medium again, they are... Uh, they are often in the form of atoms and not individual nuclei any longer. And, um, but of course, there, there is ionizing radiation also out in the cosmic medium, and that may ionize the atoms so that once again you get nuclei and electrons, uh, etc. So it's, you know, it's, um, I would say it's a, it's a kind of cycle that goes around depending on, on, on the temperature and to some extent the densities that you have, whether you will have neutral material or ionized material. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's some discussion. Uh, there are a lot of new questions appeared. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I, I just have had one question uh, or two questions here I see. Uh, one other question is that this, this means that the solar core never will reach helium burn. Well it does. Uh, it's the initial mass of the star that determines whether it will go through helium burning or not. Not the mass of the core uh, and since uh, the, the limit for helium burning is around one, is around 
half a solar mass, the sun will go through helium burning, but it will not go through carbon burning. Uh, and then there's a question how low mass stars, if low mass stars can't go beyond carbon burning, so how the abundances of elements like silicon, magnesium, and iron are measured inside them, uh, uh, I, the question is how these elements are formed inside them. Well, these elements are not formed inside them. These are elements that were in the gas when the stars formed. And it will stay there inside these stars and, and, and it will not change. And it will be part of the atmosphere of these stars. And it is through, once again, spectral line measurements of, of, uh, uh, of these stars that you can identify the silicon atoms, the magnesium atoms, iron atoms, and so on, that, you've, <clears throat> that you find in the atmospheres of these stars. But they are not produced inside these stars. They are remnants of the gas that the stars formed out of. Oh, okay, I, I go down to the bottom here then. Uh, uh, the, what, one of the questions is, are there any possibility to find any fundamentally fundamental elements in space we don't know of yet? <laughs> that is a tricky question that I'm not sure I can be safely answer, but I would say no. I, I think all of the elements, you know, that lies outside the periodic table that we see today are highly unstable elements and, and will radiatively decay in, in, in a very short time scale. And so they will not exist in space. Uh, a question is how frequent are three body collisions in stellar nucleosynthesis? And and uh, I, I would say not very frequent. Uh, uh, not even the triple alpha process is, is a true three body process. You know, you have first two helium nuclei that fuse into eight beryllium and then it, that will have to fuse uh, with another helium nucleus. So... Uh, uh, the densities are, are, as far as I understand, not high enough for three body collisions to be very effective inside stars. And then the question is, how, how important are the first stars for stellar evolution and why are they so hard to find? Well, <clears throat> the tricky thing here is that those stars that probably have played a major role for subsequent stellar evolution, those were very massive stars and they lived for only a very short while. And it may be a possibility now with a uh, space telescope like the James Webb telescopes to look at uh, very young stars in the very early universe. That is, you have to look at objects that are very far away from us. Uh, where you can actually see these uh, short-lived massive stars uh, uh, today. Uh, so that will be possible. The only remnants that we, ha that we have are, are less massive stars, that is, massive stars that are still around, even if they are almost 13.8 uh, giga years old. And, uh, and from them we get information on how the metallicity have changed over time uh, from the Big Bang and, on, and, on, and onwards. Uh, okay. Uh, one other question is, apart from the triple alpha reaction, are there any other mechanisms uh, that form carbon-12? And I, I would say not, not any efficient mechanism. It's the triple alpha reaction that, that dominates there. Uh, then there is a question, uh, the question on uh, about black holes, supernovae effects and contribution. Well, I didn't really go into that, but uh, 
when a massive star explodes as a supernova, what I said was that the material outside the core is lifted off and thrown out into the cosmic medium. And this is the way nuclear rich material is, is, um, is given back to the, uh, to the medium. If this is the case, then the core will uh, end up as a neutron star. But it could be, if the star is massive enough, that there is simply not enough energy to re to remove all of the uh, uh, of the of the envelope material. Not all of it can be expelled, and if that doesn't happen, the um, uh, that material will fall back again upon the neutron star, and then the neutron star will have to collapse as well. And then the only thing that remains is the formation of a black hole. So it is believed that the less massive, massive star will have neutron stars as their uh, remnants. And the more massive, massive stars will have black holes as their remnants. Uh, but of course, black holes is black holes, you know, they, they will not in any way contribute to the formation of, of any elements any longer. The neutron stars may, if they go through a, a binary merger, but uh, but the, the, the black holes will, will certainly not. What happens to the neutrinos that leave during the nucleosynthesis? Where does their energy end up? Well, they, they just leave the star uh, and they move with their kinetic energy uh, until they possibly or ne maybe never interact with, with, uh, with another particle some, somewhere. Uh, it's uh, for the star they are lost it's just an energy loss and in a sense for the uh, for the universe as a whole they are also lost uh, because they interact so so weakly uh, with uh, uh, with other matter they are important though and uh, the reason for that is that it's one of the few ways of looking into stars Really, you know, I mean, essentially all the information we have of stars come from the surface. It's like understanding what's inside a, a, a freezer by, uh, by, by feeling the temperature at the surface of the freezer and, and trying to understand what's inside it. Well, that was maybe a bad uh, 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 a bad picture of it, but something like that. If you really want to know how the nuclear burning processes goes on inside stars, you need something that carries information from the center of the star. And this is what the neutrinos do. And fortunately, we have been able to detect neutrinos from the sun. And they have given us the possibility to say that we, I would say to 100% know how... Uh, Hydrogen burning goes on inside the sun. And we've also ma managed to detect the, the uh, neutrinos that were released when the supernova exploded in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And that has given us a good idea on how the centers of massive star collapse and form uh, uh, neutron stars. So they are important. Uh, even for us to measure uh, as 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 measurement sticks of of different um, processes that's going on in our in our universe. Okay. Yes. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, there's one question on quantum tunneling being necessary for fusion in the core. Uh, and the question is, for particularly big stars, wouldn't the pressure be enough to overcome the electromagnetic uh, uh, repulsion? Uh, and that is not the case. Even the more massive stars do not initially have a temperature that is high enough to overcome the Coulomb repulsion between two protons. 
even there you you need the quantum uh, mechanical tunneling process of course the core of the very massive stars they will eventually need reach such high temperatures but of course then all the uh, hydrogen is gone and so on and then you're left with with um, carbon burning and oxygen burning and so on and then you still need the quantum tunneling process for for this to to work efficient, efficiently all right there is a question on the outflows of agb stars many carbonaceous molecules form that is absolutely correct which one will be more effective among the chemical reaction or nuclear reaction well you know the the formation of carbonaceous molecules surrounding the red giant stars this is pure chemistry it has nothing to do with nuclear reactions the only importance of nuclear reactions here is that uh, at some point e either when the star was formed in that material or during the evolution of the star the carbon 12 was formed but when it comes to the formation of the molecules uh, <clears throat> in the red giants, it's purely a matter of chemistry. And and I would I will not go in through the different type of chemical reactions. That that's a, a subject of its own. It's very fascinating, but it's something beyond this lecture. Um, Okay, um, um, and then uh, there's a question, are there any binary systems known containing a white dwarf that will potentially be a type 1a supernova anytime soon? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think so, uh, but I'm not sure, to be honest. The thing is that you need a, a sufficiently nearby companion. And, uh, and of course, you must be able to detect that companion. So the companion has to be either more luminous than, well, it has to be more luminous than the white dwarf to be able to detect it. I, yeah, it's an interesting question, but I'm, I'm sorry that I cannot give a definite answer on that it doesn't really come to my mind that we have an example somewhere of a white dwarf that we think will uh, become a uh, supernova type 1a in the not too near future we know that there are accreting white dwarfs that we know for sure but whether it's enough you know to to create a supernova type 1a that is another issue o okay i i think i well i've answered quite a lot of the questions at least <laughs> uh, i think all questions are now answered but i would like to use this opportunity to also ask you as one question mm -hmm. so all this uh, nuclear synthesis convert protons into neutrons. And my question is whether after the Big Bang, all nuclear synthesis in stars uh, considerably affected uh, neutron to proton abundance, basically neutron proton ratio. Well, you know, um... <clears throat> One of the reasons that Big Bang nucleosynthesis is over after a few minutes is that the free neutrons there, you know, they, they have a half lifetime of only 11 minutes. So this is what sort of stops the, uh, the, the nucleosynthesis because the, all the neutrons are gone and then the density is not high enough for, in, for anything to happen. Uh, so that just a few minutes after the big bang there are no neutrons there are no free neutrons left in the universe there are only protons and what happens during uh, uh during nuclear synthesis inside nuclear synthesis inside stars is of course that a fair fraction of of the of the protons are converted into neutrons and uh, so 
in the end, you, you end up with roughly as many neutrons as, as protons, actually. Uh, okay, thank you. So, I see currently no more questions in the chat, and also I don't see any raised hands. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I think everyone is exhausted. <laughs> yeah, we had a very nice discussion. <laughs> Everybody were very active, so we should now we thank our Go lecture on. once again for this very nice lecture. Thank you. And, and also, I thank everybody for being very active yeah. during the discussion. And mm -hmm. yeah, with this, mm -hmm. we end our today's lecture.